are now listening to Extracting Wisdom. Here to help you prevent the decay of your future is your host, Brandon Everett. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Extracting Wisdom. I am your host, Brandon Everett, and we are here live at Day 2 Voices of Dentistry Podcast Summit. And here with me, I have George Hariri. Correct. Yes. Okay. I, I got it. Okay. And that was the hard one. Now Matt you get the... Garino. Got it. Oh my gosh. There we go. I'm a master. You're pro. Hey, just <laughs> practice, guys. Don't, I practiced don't believe once. Him. One and done. Okay. Not that many times. <laughs> one and done, baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks guys so much for sitting down with me on the podcast today. I've been, uh, I wanted to have you guys on yesterday, but I'm glad we were able to make it work today. Um, so let's start with George. You guys are both dentists. Um, two, three, four years out of school, pretty new dentist. Yeah, 2016 um, grad, George, okay. 2018. Yeah. Okay. So four um, and two almost. Mm-hmm. Right. So what I would love to know is um, how is being a, like in your career now as a real dentist, different from being in dental school? Is it better? Is it worse? What do you like about it? What do you not like about it? Who wants to take it away first? I mean, I could talk for hours on this. Matt, I mean, yeah, it's, please. It's, it's, it's night and day. You know, you really can't compare of like, uh, a three hour appointment with instructors checking every little <laughs> step and you got to get your own supplies and bring them to the operatory and schedule your own next appointment. It, it's totally different. I mean, it's literally night and day. And like we always talk about, we're trying to avoid like, I'll be happier when, well, right. I mean, I'm much happier. As good. <laughs> yeah. That is Dental good to school hear. sucks in yeah. every way. <laughs> oh my gosh. I hated it so much. Um, yeah. Like it's, it, it felt like prison. Right. You know, with a sentence, you know, you're like sentence is four years and you can't do anything other than this. Pay, also paying out the ass for prison. Too. Yeah. And then it's like, <laughs> it's like that escalator at the airport you get on and it's like a super long walkway and you just have to stand there as it moves slowly <laughs> yeah, all the way down yeah. the you hall. You got that old woman in front of you, yeah. can't like <laughs> shove by. Yeah, no, and that's what dental school is like. And it's the best thing ever when it's done. Oh, I'm sure. I can, um, I'm so jealous of you guys. Let me tell you. Yeah, no, it was. And the hard part is like. I think like you've been doing this since before dental school. Right. So it makes dental school feel like 10 times longer. Because, true. True. You know, <laughs> versus like if you're actually into dental school, uh, I think it goes by a little quicker. I was never into dental school. I hated everything about it. Um, not, not everything, but like 80% of it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, so what would you say? There's a lot of talk about speed, dental school versus being mm-hmm. out of dental school. Um, why don't Tell me a little bit about that. Like, have you felt your speed get faster, your efficiency get faster, or, you know, maybe your first year, not as much, but have you noticed a jump your second, third year out? Um, I think the residency year was my big jump. Okay. Like just having so many reps, seeing so many more patients. Um, in dental school, I, the way I would get that would be like an externship or like things outside of the dental right. school where you're not, where you're seeing more patients than normal. Um, but that big jump for me was residency year. Right. I'm going to totally just, and you've probably asked, how many people have you asked that question to? Quite a few. Yeah, like three or four to this this trip here, yeah. Yeah, like I'll probably say something nobody else ever will, that I think speed has nothing to do with how long you've been out of school if you've been out of school for more than like two months. Really? Okay. And I think it has everything to do with you as a dentist. Like there are slow dentists that have been doing this for 10, 15 Definitely. years. Right. I, I graduated and I was self-conscious about my speed because that's what everyone says, right? Right. And I walked into my practice and I think one of my assistants said I was the fastest dentist that she's ever worked with. Really? In like the first month. Wow. Um. It, and that's how I was in school, like first to finish every practical, like we raced, it was fun. <laughs> and um, that's, I mean, I don't like rush. Right. I did, that's just my pace. That's just how you are. It's yeah. fast. And it's like, there are some people that think about how they do the procedure and they cut things once and they go through it. And there's other people that dink around. And I don't think how long you've been out of school will affect your personality type and how you prep teeth or, you know, you know, fiddling with matrix bands or whatever it is that's holding you back. Right. So, yeah, I think, like, if you were fast in school, you're going to be fast in practice. And if you were slow in school, two years into practice, you're still going to be slow, but you're just going to be less slow. Right. Um, so right. There's just not that formula of, like, when it's going to happen. Right. Yeah. It's, right. it's going to be different for everyone. And it, it goes by how you were before, mainly. If you were that fast person, you're going to be the fast one in, in practice. Yeah, but, like, don't rush. Right. Don't ever rush. I this agree. is somebody's mouth. Yep. You know, but, like... Think about what you're doing and in what order. Like, actually, like, sit there and look at the way you do a procedure Mm -hmm. and, like, plan out your steps and then do it the same way every time. Clay was just telling us uh, when I had him on with Tyler, he was like, pick your crown prep, write out the steps of your crown prep, and he's like, you do it the same exact way every single time. Every single time. Yeah, Yeah. and, like, also audit it and see, like, where can I make things go quicker if they're just, like, switching birds or, like, nothing that's going to impact actually, like... Uh, take, like rushing, like we were saying, right? But like getting more efficient and just yeah. like auditing, right? 
you know, and then your assistants will work faster with you when you do things the same way every time. Exactly. You walk in, the correct burr is on the handpiece. Right. You just go. You get into that routine. Yeah. And it's just like, yeah, I could do this. Like if I'm in, if I'm in any room in my office for more than 10 minutes, like something is going wrong. That's not, that's not common. Right. Right. I'm in and out all day. Yeah. And you know, but that's not because I'm like rushing or doing shitty work. It's just because I just thought about it. Exactly. So yeah. Yeah. I, I, I yeah, I think it has everything to do with the dentist and nothing to do with the amount of time they've been out the right. past two months. Right. So tell me this. How nice is it to come home after work and not have to worry about any studying or homework or anything like that? Uh, I mean, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a whole there's a whole other sets of, of things you're dealing For with. For sure. There's different um, problems. I get that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've never been more busy in my life than I have now. Now with, you know, being a podcaster, being part of share practices, still running the practice, you know, everything else in the life. Um, but I, I like doing all that so much more right. than sitting there studying I could just oh. yeah no that yeah I mean again <laughs> easiest answer ever yeah, yeah it's yeah. so much better I think but like in the office one of the lowest like one of the I didn't expect to enjoy having other people do things for you that you did, did in dental school right that was like the first thing I noticed like oh cool the assistant does that oh yeah. cool the assistant does that too oh nice the hygienist does that like yeah and you don't it's helpful you don't yeah. do a whole yeah. lot right it's really nice yeah yeah i bet and a lot of things for me that were difficult in dentistry i was like oh those are assistant things like right. getting x-rays i was packing terrible cord, you know <laughs> yeah cord getting instruments like being organized and like you know not messy they, yeah they handle that oh that's so nice because we're sitting there in clinic now all by ourselves trying to suction and, and drill and do all that stuff all at the same time i was just talking with uh, a tale of two hygienists and how Really, the curriculum should be that the hygienist, at least when you start seeing patients in dental school, should come into the school and you guys start learning how to work together because I think that would be so much more helpful to know what the hygienists do and what their scope of practice is and how they can help you um, in the most efficient way possible. Yeah, we, I went to Midwestern and we had, uh, they're like really big on this private practice model. Yes. And so we had, we all shared a hygienist, like a certain number of dental oh, students had a awesome. hygienist the full time, worked there, like not a student, like an actual hygienist. You didn't even have hygienists. Midwestern rocks, I'll tell you that. You guys yeah, had a, yeah. you guys had had a, a really great, great program. School. And um, so I walked in and I had like, you know, POEs, like your periodic mm -hmm. exams on my patients that mm -hmm. I saw and did work on. And like, that's a thing. And, um, you know, they're super inefficient periodic exams, but they yeah. are periodic exams. Right. And so, um, yeah, but that's like, that needs to be more common. Like your patients still have teeth six months from now, even though you haven't seen them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So you didn't do any profies yourself? No, I did their first profi. And then that was it. So, yeah. Wow. You do their nice. first profi as part of the comp exam, and then that's it. That's so cool. Another thing, too, that blew my mind is, um, who was I talking to? There were two younger students from Midwestern Arizona. Um, Dustin Barr, do you guys know who that is? I don't. And uh, Landon Allen? I know yeah, Landon. Know okay. Landon. Okay. They're D2s, but they are telling me, too, what is what is it just blows my mind is that at Arizona uh, Midwestern, you guys can offer your patients two free implants. Correct. They're telling With like, Bicon. That is unbelievable to me. I mean, just... If so the implant fixture is free, but they pay for the abutment crown. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, but just how, how that just makes your case acceptance probably a little bit higher than it normally well, would for if you sure, did it. Yeah. yeah. Which is so nice because at, at our school, I wish we did something like that because it's always so expensive. And I think um, there, there are ways for students to place implants, but I love that you guys don't have specialties there. We have all the specialties at our school. Yeah. Um, and it just makes, makes you guys a lot more you know, clinically versed. You guys do more, and I think you guys get your hands into more procedures and stuff like that, and I think that's awesome. So you're a dental student-based show? Yes. I'm going to go on a little tangent about this. Please. So I went to Midwestern, and I placed like eight implants, right. and I walked out of school and didn't place any. Right. And I had a buddy of mine who placed like maybe less implants, mm -hmm. and he walked out of school and placed like right away. Right. And I think it has everything to do with like, it's just, you're not you're at a dental school that like doesn't do a ton of yeah, I, I just think it's You don't not, have the opportunity. Yeah, we do, but it's like you have to apply to get into this, like, track at our, at your, uh, in your fourth year, and not everybody has, like, that chance. Like, you have to apply to get in to do this program. I think it's just awesome that you guys, like, that's just part of your curriculum. So, but, like, what's different than me and my classmate, right? My classmate walks out, places implants right away. I right. don't. It's, it's the student itself. It's, yeah. So, like, what can you do in clinic to prepare for that? Like, right. handle, like... Put yourself in clinically stressful situations right. and learn how to handle that so you're more comfortable going outside of your comfort zone and pushing yourself clinically in practice. Yeah. That's something I never did in school that like, you know, for all the students out there, do that. Okay. You know, that's like my one big regret from dental school right. is not becoming more comfortable with being uncomfortable clinically. 
Yeah, right. Yeah, and I to I totally agree, and that's something I do mention a lot is you know taking advantage of, of dental school and doing those things that maybe you're not comfortable with while you have that supervision there and while you have yeah. that help because I think that's just going to make you a better clinician in the long run. Like you'll make every mistake at least once. Right. Try to make as many of them in school yeah. <laughs> than out of school. It's right. a lot easier. Yeah, exactly. And with things like implants and like root canals, for example, like you can get almost all the way there of doing them without actually have like doing them. Sure. So like for implants, you could really get good at sectioning teeth and laying flaps and suturing and like seeing bone and looking at it, thinking about what it, what would it look like if I put an implant in here right. or for the molar root canal, like doing the pulpectomies when they're just there for an emergency appointment and like right. feeling how getting down canals and even though you're not maybe not going to fill it. Right. So like you can get almost all the way there even in a dental school environment. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, just starting with those steps. Um, another thing you guys mentioned too, and I, I want to make sure I give you guys the shout out, is you guys are part of the Shared Practice Podcast, correct? Correct. So tell me a little bit about that. Like, what have you guys been doing? So Richard Lowe started the podcast yes. in 2017, correct, George? Or 16? Um, 16. 16, yeah. okay. Um, geared towards getting in dentists into ownership. Um, so he was a pre-owner at the time and was literally just having people on who knew more than him and he was asking them, look, like, how do I get into ownership? Like, what do I look for? How do we do it? Uh, George came on a year later and the podcast blew up after that. Um, so right now we have, we have three shows that we're running, you know, every week. Um, on our feed. On our, yeah. on our main share practice feed. Mondays we have Richard doing a leadership season, you know, bringing people and getting perspectives about that. Mm -hmm. Wednesday we have the pursuit of ownership, which is our pre-owner um, interns who are gearing a show towards getting people in ownership, you know, our main focus from the beginning. And then George and I uh, do practice on our water on Fridays, which is uh, bringing anonymous owner guests on and evaluating their practices through metrics. Yeah, that's really cool. Tyler was telling me about that. You guys like use voice changers and everything mm -hmm. like yeah. that. That's I think that's a really cool idea because not only like you you keep the dentist anonymous, but it's a really great learning tool too. I think. Well, like right now, right, our names are shared. Right. So like they all know this is George talking. Right. So George is not going to share certain things. Because George is talking. Right. So once you undo that and you like, we do it backwards, right? We like show the dentist practice naked, but like we cover who they are. Right. And we, you know, we can look at it and we can have an intimate conversation with that person that you would never have if you told yeah. anybody their name. Yeah. You, you set that environment. I think that's really, really cool. That's awesome. How do you guys like being podcasters? That's fun. Yeah. I, mean, yeah, I, I like talking. It's one of the most nice. enjoyable things we do, I think. Yeah. Like we, we, do, uh, we record interviews separately and intro outros together, and it's some of my funnest times. Yeah, week. the intro outros we have a lot of fun with. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Those are always yeah. a good time. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love podcasting. Like, it's so refreshing, especially at a conference like this where this is the focus, is to meet other podcasters and other people that just love talking dentistry. I think it's so fun. Yeah. yeah. Do you see a co-host in your future, or do you prefer like kind of the one-on-one -on -one it really doesn't Diana. matter. I mean, at this point, Tyler Tolbert is going to be a co-host because he's been on every other episode <laughs> of mine. No, but I, I love Tyler. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've, I mean, whoever, like I, I always say, it, I don't really care. As, as anybody who wants to talk dentistry, I'm always willing to have that, have them on. Like, I don't care if it's a pre-dental student, a dental student, dentist, you know, CEO of Proceed Finance with, with Dave Rohr that I just did a, an episode with. Like, anybody that wants to talk, I'm always open. So, so what is your, what are your plans? As far We're as flip the script on you. Okay. Right. I love it. Yeah. As far as like <laughs> as far as like after dental school and that kind of thing? Well, I'm assuming, yeah. Okay. Well during dental school, as I said, you're in prison. Right. I'm in prison. What are your so plans after, during prison isn't as fun of a question. Out. Right. So after I'm I'm <laughs> done get being out. locked up. Yeah. Um, so I'm thankful and very humbled I received the Navy's HPSP scholarship. Nice. So, and I got the four year scholarship. So four years after dental school I'll be with them. Who knows where I'll be or what I'll you know what I'll end up doing, but I think that's going to be a great opportunity for me to really get my clinical efficiency up and really get a lot of practice in and a lot of reps in, like you were saying. Um, so when I'm done with those four years, I'm definitely going to start up my own practice. Um, startup? Startup, uh -oh. scratch startup, maybe maybe an acquisition. I don't know. But, George, um, easy. Uh, All right. What, 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 do you got, what do you have to say, George? No, I mean, it, so <laughs> you don't listen to our show, which is fine. I don't want you, you know, like, but... Um, I need to, though, and I, 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 that's what I said. I, I really need to start listening. So I have a very strong bias. That's fine. Let me hear it. Startup. Let me hear it. Well, it's, it's like just the fact that the fastest, simplest, most predictable, and successful way to get into practice ownership right. is by buying an existing practice. Sure. Yeah. That, that's like my only objection with a startup. Okay. So why am I doing it? Why are you, why are you starting Why am I spending 18 months and equal amount of money for a building with no patients right? in a I place where I could have bought a 
bought that practice 18 months ago with patients. Right. And I get that. I mean, I think it all comes down to personal preference. Obviously, that is the straightest path, I guess. But if you're somebody who wants to build something truly from the ground up and des and wants to go through that whole design phase and design your own office the exact way you want it and you envision um, specific procedures and systems that you have in place, you want your you want your office designed to be tailored to that way of that you want to work. And that's, I love that, that answer. Yeah. Because that's like the answer that like, I, I love when people say it that way because okay. they're acknowledging this doesn't make sense. Right. But I want to do it anyway for right. these reasons. Right. Like I, I can really respect that. Okay. And like I talked to Ashley Yovis. Do you know who that is? No. Um, she has this Making of the Dental Startup Facebook group. Got it. And she has this practice that is like, um, it's called Smile & Co. Okay. And Or Smile & Company, whatever. Right. Um, and like, she's like, yeah, I was really thinking about my ideal patient a lot and my branding. And like, if you're like that, then yeah, like you probably need to do a startup. Like, mm -hmm. I don't care about any of that stuff. Right, right. So like for me, it's simplest, fastest, most efficient path to for what sure. I want. For sure. But like for you, you're like, I don't want that. I, I, I don't want the thing that might make the most sense logically. I want the thing that allows me to have control over every little part about my practice and my life as a dentist. Right. I can really respect that reason to do a right. startup. And who knows? My, my opinion can definitely change when I start looking for practices and stuff like that. But I mean, I guess that's just where my head is at right now. But obviously, that could all be thrown out the yeah. window down and the road. I think, yeah. yeah, everything is... You know, I think opening yourself up to be any, in any way change your opinion is totally. Yeah. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you guys about is like what your practice environments are right now. Um, you know, how is it going? What's your relationship like with your, you know, with the other doc or colleague or whatever? Like, how is that going so far? Yeah, I'll start. So I bought my office uh, about a year and a half ago. Oh, okay. Um, the seller did a really short transition, and uh, currently it's like a mainly a solo with a very part-time associate. Got it. Okay. Um, it's like a five-op office getting the two hygienists and uh, two assistants, two at the front and an associate on Saturdays. Um, so contrasting to George, who is more of a group model, right. um, I'm very much like that, having control, having everything run right. through me and, you know, being, being the guy at the end of the day. Gotcha. And are you doing implants or when you can yeah. or, okay. Yeah, I do. I do a bunch, you know, as many as I can. I market for them. You know, I, I really believe and I enjoy doing them. It's my favorite procedure. Yeah. That's um, so awesome. You know, anytime I can, you can do different things over the course of a day is, is perfect for me. Uh, that's good. What about you? Yeah, so uh, I bought my practice a little over a year ago um, from, yeah, so I employed the, the lady who I bought it from for six months, and then I replaced her with an associate. So I practice with an associate. We have a team of 11. Mm -hmm. and um, How many ops? Eight. Oh, okay. So eight ops, that's four hygienists, three assistants, and then two front desk and an office manager, and then an associate. And okay. Me. Um, and so we, yeah, we have a ton of fun. I mean, like my... So clinically, um, I delegate a ton. Right. Uh, I have expanded function assistants who place composites. I have a denturist who does my dentures. I, like, I, I really do, do very little right. clinically as much as possible. And I, we have a really fun, loving culture. I think that's something I'm really big on is having a lot of fun at the office with my team. And um, very informal environment. And uh, we take insurance. And I mean, I do place implants. And my associate places implants. And so we just kind of do. I think we refer out molar endo, uh, some difficult wisdom teeth right. and um, ortho, like okay. braces, but we'll do Invisalign. So awesome. We, we try you to guys do, do a lot. Yeah, we do quite a bit. That's really good. I, I love when practices do that. Um, now, when are your offices typically open? Like what are your hours? Monday through Friday. Monday through Friday? Just business hours, Friday we close at two. Okay. Yeah, I'm Monday through Thursday and every, every other Saturday. Okay, so you have Fridays off too. Fridays are off, yeah. Yeah, that's nice. So I work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh -huh. and then my associate works um, she works four and a half days, so she's there kind of all the time, and then I'm there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Gotcha. One thing I appreciate about about your office is you said, you know, you, you do very little, and I think, you know, maybe to some people are like, well, why is he doing very little? But I think that's such a plus because, like, Dr. Costas was talking the other day, your, your office, the ideal office should be able to function without you there, and I think that's, you know, if there was ever something that happened, surgery, injury, whatever it is, like, your office could still function, and I think that's a, that's a very important move, I guess, or the way th that your practice is modeled is great. Yeah. And then if you think about it, like, so pretty much my staff does everything they're legally able to do. Right. And like, that's, that's as far as we go, obviously. So like, that means I do as little as I can legally do. Right. And that means my body can sustain this for as long as possible, exactly. yeah. which is my biggest concern as a dentist, because I'm a golfing dentist and <laughs> there you go. golfing dentists <laughs> typically don't have very long careers, you know, or they have back issues or whatever. So it's very important to me to be very and 
don't sit in the chair for too long with a patient or else I might not be able to practice as long. And that's another thing too. Uh, again, I'm going to go back to the a tale of two hygienists too. We were talking about how we can use, how can you, you can use your hygienists and assistants to their fullest potential and everything that they're legally allowed to do, which if you're somebody who does implants or any other surgeries like that, frees your time up instead of doing composites all day long. Like you can focus on your bigger cases, which I think is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's and it's awesome. important too for the students listening to realize like you don't need to be a super producer to make a really good living. Oh, a hundred percent. George yes. has designed his office in a way where he doesn't need to be that in order right. to, you know. Yeah, no, well. I, I, I have had periods of my career where I have produced, you know, numbers that, you know, would impress people, but I much rather prefer, like for me, $3,000 a day is a very ideal day. Right. Um, my associate does much more than that, and that's the way I like it. Yeah. So I like to go into the office very light schedule and, um, you know, very easy, and I kind of chill and don't take it very hard and, right. you know, make a good living. So that's kind of my model. Yeah, and it really is up to personal preference. Like, how, how is it being the boss of your practice? So I'm, I'm different in that way in that I'm, I'm trying to produce a lot every day. Right. Like, I'll, right. I'll shoot for an $8,000 day, you know, pretty much most days. Um, it's, it's a lot more taxing. I mean, I, I'm in the chair a lot more. Um, but then I, I enjoy, I enjoy it though. Exactly. Like, well, that's all that matters, you yeah. know? Um, so it's, it's just different models. It's, it's kind of thinking about whatever you prefer, whatever you see yourself, how your day goes. You know, if I'm in the chair a lot doing high productive dentistry, I'm having a good day. Like, that's, yeah, that's it. And are, do you do all your own? Are you in charge of the marketing and, and all of that too? So, I mean, I'll outsource like services. Like I'm not, I'm not a marketer. I'm not about to learn how that's done. So I, I pay a company and I pay a company to answer my, answer my new patient phone calls. Um, pay for, you know, anything, any services that's going to save me time and be Absolutely. more efficient. I'm going to yeah. go for it. Who do you use for your marketing? Um, I use Dr. Multimedia. They're out in okay. San Diego. Okay. Um, they do a good job. Is it, is it more, is it web-based marketing or do they do like mailers and stuff too? Yeah. So they do uh, SEO, run Google ads yeah, yeah. And, and kind of manage my Google ranking. Mm -hmm. um, just started with them a couple months ago, but definitely has already improved SEO. I know we get in some debates on the show about our thoughts on different types of marketing and um, we have fun with it. So George, what are your thoughts on marketing? Yeah. So, um, I mean, SEO is the one that he's looked at me for. We have like, he believes in it. I just, I believe in the idea of it. I just don't think anybody can actually execute on it. Um, that's kind of my issue on it. Um, but yeah, so I, we use the same Dr. Multimedia company for our web marketing and then, uh, yeah, we do some direct mail. So okay. that's kind of our combination from what I've heard too. And it really depends on the area, obviously that you're in, but mailers do very well. Like you would think now that a lot of people are just looking on their, you know, social media and stuff like that for, for dentists or doctors or whatever, but the mailers, I, from what I understand, are really good. It's funny because we just walked out of like a presentation that talked about uh, how, you know, like direct mail is like a very competitive environment. You shouldn't do it. Right. And it's like, well, it's kind of a really predictable environment and you definitely should do it. Yeah. And it is, um, sure, it's expensive, but it's also very effective. Right. And so it's like a very safe thing to do. And it just, I think the really thing that we've learned about direct mail is it really depends on the income of your population. So, sure you know, lower income populations respond to a certain type of messaging, higher income populations respond to a different type of messaging. Yeah. And so understanding like direct mail can be a lot of different things and understanding what your patient base, what their incomes are, what type of, what they're looking for in a dentist and then catering your direct mail towards that approach mm -hmm. can make a really big difference. Right. Yeah, I totally agree. Now, do you guys, will you guys run multiple different ads at a, t at a time and kind of test to see which one you get a higher response from? Yeah, that's like all the time. Yeah, all the definitely. time. So what, what kind of things are you running against each other? So like, you'll just try a medium or, okay. you, yeah. like, you know, especially with what we do, right? Have a you lot of tried like radio or any, or billboards or anything I have like not that? tried radio or no. billboards. I've tried, uh, oh gosh, the gauntlet of things I've tried. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've tried everything short of that. Okay. I mean, a lot of social media stuff I've tried. Sure. Uh, a lot of, so I, I, the things that I come back to, how about like, sure. I've tried what, a lot. What you come back to, yeah. I come uh, back to pay-per-click. Okay. So like Google AdWords. Mm-hmm. Um, direct mail, and then I, I do invest in SEO. Okay. Just in case it works. <laughs> just in case, yeah, okay. Um, and I mean, then Google reviews. Yeah, that was going to say, our favorite type of marketing is definitely Google reviews. Like, that really sets you apart. That's probably how I draw the most people into my practice. Yeah, like, we have 300 and something Google reviews from yeah. our practice. Like, it's a big thing. Right. So, okay, so here's a good question. Do you, How do you guys push that to your patients? Do you have, like, an, an iPad right there that they can leave a review, or do you guys just word of mouth? Like, how do you guys tell them about that? So it's a policy in my office that we do not mention anything about a Google review to a patient. Got it. It is not brought up. We don't care. We just have the... Have it is a, what it is. It just is what it is. We have the service called Swell. Okay. And they text all of our patients after the appointment. And something about the way they do it versus everybody else yeah. 
they just get the most reviews. Huh. And you just like, the way have the process the most efficient, whatever, it's like $150 a month. And we get like 20 to 25 reviews a month just using that service and just doing our typical patient experience without even trying for a Google review. Yeah, mine's the exact same. I mean, we don't, we don't mention it and we'll, we'll probably get more like 10 a month just, just from that. Yeah, okay. right. So the more patients you see, the more reviews you get. So right. we happen to have a, you know, four hygienists, he has two. So, you know, that's kind of... Gotcha. And here's something too I'm wondering about because I'm not... I mean, obviously, I'm still a student, so I don't haven't really looked into Google reviews and all that too much. But um, what about Yelp too? Are you guys getting Yelp reviews? Not trying, not no. trying, or okay. caring. But do you guys ha- do you do they come in for your office? No, no, no. not no. Okay, I don't think anyone dentist near in my area has a any Yelp. So like some okay. areas are Yelp areas. Right. Like you're you live I in see. Chicago, so yeah, like Chicago's yeah. a big Yelp town. Right. Um, you know, I think you have to look at your patient base and what they're looking for. Um, in my area, it's a suburban area. You know, we're very Google review oriented versus uh, Yelp. Okay, well, that's good to know. I didn't know that, so that's that's good. Um, well, we're we're coming up on the half hour mark here. I want to pick your brains on just a couple more things before I let you guys go. Sure. Now that you guys are, I would still consider you guys new dentists, obviously. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, what would you say to either yourself graduating dental school or other dental students to try to focus on in dental school? Um, to make sure that they have the most success possible as new dentists? I mean, I think just getting as much clinical experience as you can in that environment, and I know it's tough, just like seeing different specialty procedures, even if it's not you doing them, like get exposure to a lot of different things, a lot of different viewpoints from different instructors, and then like also making time for the business side of it. Like if you see practice ownership in your future, that you're reading business books, you're listening to podcasts, you know, you're getting exposure outside of the school because you're not going to get one inside the school. That's great advice. Would you, have you taken any CE courses that really focus on business? I mean, I think we both love Breakaway. We both Breakaway. Took the yes. Breakaway practice. I've heard of that messes. and that's definitely something that yeah, I'm going to file away. Okay. Yeah. Now, which, is it the new dentist boot camp? Is that the um, one you guys took no, or which one? No. The business masters is really the best one. They, they have, have, a, they have okay. a student pricing that it makes it pretty reasonable. Oh, so. uh, okay. Not for the business masters. They don't? No, it's just a startup course. Okay. So they, sure? try to, they try to get people to take the startup course. Okay. Um, I mean, if you're going to do a startup, right. it almost should be illegal to do a startup without taking something like that. <laughs> yeah, well, I would agree. Yeah. So um, so if you're going to do a startup, you go to a startup course first, and then you go to business masters before you open. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, so you would recommend that. Like, that's worth worth the money. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah? Okay. It's laughable how much it's worth the money. Okay, yeah. yeah. And I would agree with that. It's just some people don't value that CE very much. Like, oh, they look at just the sticker price, and they don't realize the money that they will save or earn because of that CE. I think the, the business master is like $3,000. It's not like a ridiculous amount of money, right. and it gives you, like, so much value that it's, yeah. yeah. Um, any other advice from you, George, that you can think of? Yeah, so clinically, I would say... You know, for me, based on the thing I didn't do, I would say put yourself in clinically stressful situations and start to get comfortable with that feeling of clinical stress right. so that you don't avoid it as much in your career. And then um, from like a more business side, like definitely what Matt kind of echo what he said, but then also to add to it, you know, really just understand yourself. Start learning about yourself. What do you like? What do you not like? What procedures do you like? Why do you like them? And I think graduating as somebody that understands a lot about themselves and as a dentist will help them make decisions early in their career of what kind of dentist they want to be or what path. I mean, like, realistically, you can have anything you want in life. Nothing is off the table. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. That is for sure a thing. Yeah. So what do you want? Nothing off the table. Learn about yourself so you can better make that decision. That's awesome. That's great advice. And I really I really appreciate the input from you guys being new dentists. Like, you know, I'm looking up to you guys, and, and it's good to hear all of these things um, and that you guys are willing to help other dental students like me make sure that, uh, you know, we can hit the ground running when we uh, start practicing. Of course. So. I want to give you some acknowledgement, Brandon. Like, you're like a budding star at this. I, <laughs> I had never heard of you before this weekend, I'll admit it. But, yeah. uh, like, you're getting all these amazing guests on. You got Howard Ferran, yeah. the ProSeed <laughs> CEO. Like, you're crushing it. And thanks for, like, helping dentists, dental students out there. Because, yeah. like, they need your voice. Well, I Great appreciate it. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I mean, it's just, you know, I love helping others. I love being, um, you know, a mentor to people or just a friend or, and I, and it's just fun. I love talking to you guys and, and other dental students and dentists and, and whoever, like I said earlier, but, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just a lot of fun. That's awesome, so, man. Well, thanks again, Matt, George. Thanks yeah. so much for being on the show and, uh, hopefully we'll have you guys on again soon. Sounds thanks. good. All right, guys, thanks, take man. care. Thank you.